So thank you very much uh, everyone to join uh, today for this webinar about uh, solar heating and how can cities use solar heating to decarbonize their district heating system. Uh, this session is organized by the Covenant of Mayors uh, Office as uh, in collaboration with the International Energy Agency uh, Solar Heating and Cooling Pass 68 name uh, Efficient Solar District Heating. Um, I'm very pleased today to have uh, very uh, nice speakers to explain us what is this technology, what this technology can bring to cities, uh, and also very nice example of what has been already done and uh, as it's a um, proven technology to uh, decarbonize already our uh, energy system in the different cities. So. Today we have uh, three different speakers. Uh, first, Barbell Epp, who is Director of Solrico and the Communication Advisor for International Energy uh, Agency Solar Heating and Cooling Task uh, 60A. And she's going to uh, explain us what are the benefits from solar district heating and who can uh, use it uh, across Europe mostly. Then we'll move to a very uh, nice example. Um, of what cities can do and what are the different steps for a municipality to launch a solar heating uh, project with uh, the example explained by Roger Axtock, who is the managing director of Austria Solar and uh, with a very long experience in the field. And then we'll move to another uh, also astonishing example, uh, this time in Latvia, um, and we have the chance to have Ina Berzina Vaita, who is the managing director of Solas Pils Siltums, sorry, um, uh, with a, so the municipal company of the of the city of Salas Pils in Latvia, and she is also uh, the advisor of uh, the new uh, or upcoming. Um, uh, uh, energy uh, minister, sorry, and uh, she's also uh, in the director of the Latvian uh, District Eating uh, Association. Um, yeah, so three different speakers, very experienced one. Um, we'll have 15 minute presentation for each of them, and after each presentation, uh, we'll have a time for a Q&A, so uh, yes, so that you can uh, hear. Uh, I mean, get the answer to your different question. So let's start with first with uh, Barbell. I give you the floor. Okay, thanks, Julia, for the nice introduction. Uh, welcome from my side. Uh, I, well, I speak uh, today on behalf of this long title IEA Solar Heating and Cooling um, to explain you it's a research uh, organization worldwide active around 200 researchers grouped together and uh, look into different aspects and applications of solar heat and I represent the one which are particularly working on solar district heating. Yeah, we have an enormous task ahead of us. You have maybe heard about um, the new EED directive from, uh, from Brussels, uh, really stimulating certain um, shares of renewable heat and decarbonizing of district heating. We have around 6,000 district heating networks across Europe that needs to be decarbonized in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. And in this presentation, I will show you a bit how it works and who so is already successfully using this solar heat in, in their district heating networks. We have um, across Europe, you might fight your country on this map, already 264 towns and cities that use solar heat. The dark orange ones, which are Austria, Germany, Denmark and uh, Sweden are the front runners. They have uh, between 200, uh, between 100 and, and 20 systems already installed. So they have a long history already and they are sort of the, the pioneering countries. In the other countries, some of them, they have mostly below 10 systems and you find in the box always the number of systems and uh, the capacity so you see a little bit in your country
country how far this technology is already spread. But it can be used from the very north in Europe to the very south. Obviously, the yield is different and the performance is a bit different, but you can see, you see here that it's, um, it's not limited to a certain region. How does it work? You always have like your collector field, which can look very different depending on the collector type you use, which is pr the producer of your solar heat. You have radiation and it's black and it absorbs heat and makes hot water or sometimes even steam. You have a storage which uh, corresponds to the field and gives you the chance to, to store your heat from the field over the day. Then you always need your heating center, like your it's all always the, the boiler is included there and brings up the temperatures that you need in your um, supply chain um, network. So this is basically how it works. The advantages are very straightforward. Solar heat is absolutely emission free and helps you to meet your climate targets on a regional as well as on the national level. You have um, increased energy security. This is the motivation of uh, many municipalities that we have seen as front runners in the past that they wanted to get away from oil and gas and um, they wanted to have their own local resources. The sun may be combined with biomass. Importantly, nowadays as well, when prices in the gas and oil field are very volatile, they remain stable. Solar heat prices remain stable. So you have a very clear perspective on where your heat prices will stay over 20 years and uh, the fossils never give you this guarantee. And the components are mostly produced in Europe. So there's very little which comes from Asia and the collectors are ma mainly produced in Europe. So you always have local jobs and local value chains. You can use solar district heating from the very small towns to the very big towns. And I will show you some example. This is a German town. They started seven years ago um, to reorganize their heat supply and wanted to be independent. They are today heating their houses 100% renewables. There's very small number of participants which are part participating in the district heating grid, which was newly installed. They all deposit 4,000 euros, formed an, a communic uh, an um, 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 like an association and they pay now a very stable price with 112 euro per megawatt hour. No basic price is charged and it's fixed over the years. So they have built all these red lines. They, they digged into the ground of their village and digged all the district heating ones. They have a sh solar share of 17% today. The field is here and they're really happy with their energy community um, and they've combined it with a wood boiler. So this was their planning period. They started already 2013. So you see very long before we even had energy crisis in Europe uh, with a pre-visibility study. They founded the corporation 2014. The big step was then the contracting um, signed with a turnkey provider. We recommend this to all smaller towns that they who not have a utility themselves you know, that they um, sign a turnkey provider, EPC, so that the whole solar district heating uh, together with the piping in the ground is done from one uh, turnkey provider. Um, then the big step, the, uh, also an important one, is the issuing of the building permit and usually the installation. I think Ina probably later will also um, confirm that the installation itself um, or the construction itself is, is uh, the least uh, time. You know, the planning time is usually longer and this uh, like four or five years period was before EU speeded up permitting a normal time period. We hope that within the transition discussions now, these periods will get a bit easier and, and the issuing of the permit will get a bit faster. Also, don't forget that solar collector fields don't seal the ground. So you always have natural ground below it. You have animals using it. You can even have, you know, flowering um, ground, which for insects. So it's not it's not something which is sealing the ground. So it's it's always combined with ecological measures as well. 
And uh, what I already mentioned is that solar heat is a time of a kind of a team, a team player and can be very well uh, combined with biomass. And this is an example from Denmark. This field um, works in combination with a biomass boiler and reduces the pressure on using biomass in summer. The board here was very happy with their decision on solar heat and I quote the second sentence saying and we will have safe costs when the system produces solar energy in summer because we can shut down one of our two wood chip boilers during that time. So this is really the idea if you want to get uh, rather independent of oil and gas you have a biomass boiler for the winter and in summer your solar heat system takes over almost 100% so you can do the revision of your biomass boiler by closing uh, or shutting down it over a period of three to four months. And what is also nice about this utility, Grena, that they have the fifth lowest district heating prices in a study from June 2022, uh, according to the Danish Supply Authority. So they have very stable and very cost competitive heat prices because of this renewable um, sources. Well, to, just to, to confirm that again, biomass and solar heat is a good match. Um, you can obviously um, save money by using less wood chips or pellets or whatever in summer. And you have less stress for the biomass boiler because um, the, you know, working on a, on a demi uh, capacity the whole summer is, is a lot of uh, going backwards and forwards. So that's um, also a good argument. I told you solar heat can be rather small. We were talking about 1.7 megawatt in this plant before. And now we have the largest plant in Europe. Um, it's in Silkeborg in Denmark with 110 megawatt. It's in a city with 22, uh, 21,000 consumers on the district heating network. You see how nicely it was integrated into the nature. The Danish cities mostly have a lot of green land around them. So um, it's always possible to do it um, on, on green land as here. It was already commissioned in December 2016 and I think it was um, one of it and it covers a share of 20%. So if we go with this 20% share now into even larger cities like Turin has a big district heating network where 850,000 people are connected to and we made a theoretical um, you know calculation if you want to cover 20% of this huge amount in your district heating, um, you need this uh, rectangle, which is, uh, you know, marked here next to the airport. So you see that um, the airport covers already a big uh, portion and the field that you need is almost the size of the airport. So we want to say that it's really possible to find space even in larger cities. It's also not obligatory to have the system immediately next to the heating center of your city, but you can also inject into the grid and be a bit aware from the heating center. So the, the rough estimation is three to four square meters per kilowatt solar heat capacity for a rule of thumb. Yeah, now all the examples I showed you so far had a solar fraction of five to 20 percent, if you remember well, you know, like 17 to 20 around this range. If you want to get higher to 30 to 60 percent solar fraction in your district heating grid, you need what we call a seasonal storage. And this seasonal storage um, takes over the, uh, the plus uh, heat in the summer months and stores it. And then you can use it in the winter months here in September to December in this yellow part of your heat demand curve. And you will reduce a lot um, significantly significantly your um, winter or autumn um, usage of your fossils or biomass boiler. I will show you how this how this looks like. These um, you know, seasonal storages are mostly just digged into the ground like big swimming pools. You have a foil, you know, like covering um, which is um, very strong. It can support even 80, 90 degree because this storage can get at the top layer like 90 degree in summer and it will, this is the construction part, it will receive um, an insulated cover which can be also sometimes walked on, you know, so that you at the end have only a hill which you can use for recreation or something it's not used land and below it you have this um, you know storage which uh, improves your or increases your um, solar heat uh, uh, share over the year 
And one last aspect, uh, because I mentioned it already in big cities where you have larger fields planned. In this case, it's a 40 megawatt plant. So it's a third of Silkeborg, you know, this plant, which is um, foreseen here, which is in Pristina in Kosovo. You can go away from your district heating field, you know, like if you have large capacities, you can go here. It's planned like four kilometers outside the city. This has to do with the price of land. So because everybody knows that within the outskirts of a city, land is usually more expensive because it's used for construction. So um, be aware that you can be also away from the here. It's a 1.6 kilometer pipeline between the power plant, which is here, you know, which is the producer of the district heat or nowadays and uh, the field and the city, you have certain um, distances which are possible, you know. This is a planned system which will start construction next year. Yeah, so the summary of my short speech is that uh, bioma solar heat is a team player. We have seen that it works very well with biomass boilers to form a 100% renewable supply. If this is your objective, it works very well together with seasonal storages to form this flexible energy management system. Um, I have not mentioned that obviously this, these huge basins in the ground can also be used to store power to heat or store waste heat from an industry um, if it's a bit you know, like peaking or something. What I have not mentioned is um, that also solar heat can work very well together with heat pumps uh, um, for forming a decarbonization strategy when temperatures in your district heating grid are above 80 degrees. Then you can uh, lift again via the heat pumps your um, heat from the collector fields to a higher temperature level. So you see that combinations are well done with solar heat and all is possible here. Yeah, for your technical further advice, we listed here some engineering uh, service companies and research companies which are active in this task 68 that we mentioned before, all very capable to do visibility studies, for example. You might find one close to you or contact them if you need further technical advice. And here we have listed for your records. I think we will share with you the presentation afterwards. Technology and turnkey suppliers which have done large solar district heating fields already in Europe. If you do a tendering, um, you know already where the offers will come from. So this was it from my side. I thank you very much for the attention and I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you very much for this presentation, uh, introductory presentation about uh, solar heating and cooling. Uh, if you have any question, can you please uh, ask them in the chat or um, yeah, raise your hand maybe, uh, and then I will uh, give you the floor. Uh, we already have one question. Um, please go ahead. I cannot see your full name, but welcome. De la Roche Lambert. <clears throat> so hi. Uh, I'm very interested uh, in uh, solar heating, uh, in district heating and cooling also. Um, you, you you did not mention the the level of uh, temperatures in the different uh, district heating. So um, how to manage uh, solar heating, which can uh, offer uh, around uh, 1800 100, 100, uh, um, degrees uh, compared to a low temperature um, uh, district heating, what first question, and uh, can you uh, tell us about the, the possibility to use also uh, concentration technologies uh, such as Heliac technology, uh, which is very interesting and very cheap also, uh, to, uh, to use uh, this high level uh, temperature heating for um, industrial uh, use or for uh, more reduced uh, storage uh, volumes. Well, you are you are very good informed already that you know about Haliak. I think we wanted to have this first webinar rather yes. on introducing system combinations, giving you case studies, motivating the participants to do the first steps into uh, getting to know solar heat. And uh, the questions that you ask me on temperature levels will be more tackled in the second webinar. Right. Uh, but uh, to give you a short insight, I mean, usually um, district heating systems are 
are still run above um, 100 degree. And obviously, you cannot do this with a stationary collector directly, but you have to do, as you said, a concentrating one. We have only very few demonstration plants yet in Europe, but I think they will come. But in the meantime, what we have seen is in Denmark that usually the combination was done with heat pumps, with high temperature heat pumps. So the seasonal storage, for example, can be emptied if it has 80 degree on top via heat pump so that you go into a district heating grid with 130 degree. We also have if district heating grids, and I think Ina will tell us a very nice story on that, that if you multi, uh, if you modernize them in advance and you have a lowering of the your feed line temperature because you have modern houses and modern solar stations in the houses, then you can go directly with a high temperature flat plate collector, which is also an advantage. Okay. But you, you are a bit um, taking points, technical points that we will to go in more detail in the next um, webinar where we have engineers and planners on board which give you insights into that. Yeah, thank you very Hope much. this answered your question. Thank yes, you yes, very yes. much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, is there other question? Indeed, it's uh, good to mention uh, and I have not done it yet uh, that there will be a second webinar to go more in depth. Um, and in this second webinar, we'll tackle uh, the tendering process for municipalities who want to develop their own uh, uh, plans uh, and also some tips uh, regarding uh, planning and finding land. More in details, but we will also tackle the technical and uh, economic aspect more in depth. Uh, and this second webinar uh, will be on the 5th of June uh, at the same time as today. I will send you the link to register uh, in the chat as well. Um, are there other questions uh, from the audience at this stage? Yeah, there, there are two in the chat, maybe very briefly. I mean, we have uh, there somebody asking again on concentrating heat. I think for 350 degree, uh, I don't know whether this is really necessary if you want to have a 110 degree uh, district heating grid, but there are concentrating um, technologies available for um, higher temperatures and I think it will take probably another year or two where we see larger concentrating solar fields in Europe first for industry and they produce around 250 degree which could also be used for um, district heating but we wanted to concentrate a bit more what is already there and what what where we have a lot of showcases and this is not the case with concentrating and the second question says what is the temperature losses in the case of Pristina um, if you go to the distance of 4.2 kilometers I think this was probably not in detail yet calculated but I, what, what I want to give you in Pristina they have also this huge seasonal storage and the seasonal storages are very well understood from Denmark because they have four or five of them like with 200,000 square meters and it de depends very much on the top how good the top is you know the cover but it has about 10 to 20 degree over the whole year so this is um, for such a basin which is earth ground mounted you know and it's not insulated the walls are not insulated only the top is insulated I think it's a very good good um, cost uh, like uh, heat heat saving uh, component so it's 10 to 20 degree and I would say that the installation of the piping itself covers only maybe another two or three percentage uh, losses. Thank you very so, much uh, Pavel for these answers. Um, maybe I'll have a, I'll have a, I have a last uh, question um, about the you mentioned about the seasonal storage can the seasonal storage be used for uh, all to store other heat sources maybe on top of solar yeah well this is this was very much done in Denmark now I think the Danish they have the system of power to heat so they have only like an electric element in their storages and they take uh, the surplus heat from winter nights when the wind is is you know blowing so much that the grid doesn't take this electricity this is called power to heat and I think Ina you, you already knock your uh, head I think you probably do that as well maybe you can say a word on this or maybe now just go into it. You use this already? 
Uh, now we are looking for that, but I will tell you a little bit maybe after in presentation. But I will also mention about the power in solar. So, mm -hmm. so I think that this um, also like waste heat potential, you know, like waste heat is often a seasonal one. D different industries have seasonal, um, you know, uh, usage or, or availability of waste heat. So also for waste heat, these seasonal storages can be used. What is very ideal is that they have, you know, incoming inlets in all levels. So if you have a lower temperature, source you can go in the middle and if you have a higher temperature source you get to the top so solar goes rather to the top and so you you can the, there's like a leveling in the storage tank which uh, makes it possible to keep the hot the very hot air and water on the top and empty it from there so it's very flexible and I think we will see more. We the, the photo I showed you actually is not a seasonal storage next to a solar system, unfortunately in Germany, but just one which will take waste heat and, and power to heat. And it's built in Germany right now next to an utility. So you see already that seasonal storages will receive a functionality in heat planning and in managing, you know, sector coupling in a long run, almost independent from solar thermal. But if you have a seasonal storage, solar thermal is very nice to be integrated or you plan it as part of your solar system. So, but this storage I showed you the photo from is, is not, not have solar heat yet, but it's a seasonal storage. Okay, thanks a lot. So yeah, indeed, uh, a very uh, important uh, feature to go further for the carbonization of district heating for sure. Thanks a lot, Babel. Uh, we'll move to uh, another best, I mean, to move to in depth into a best practice uh, from Austria. And I give the floor to Roger Axtock, a managing director of Austria Solo. Yeah, hello from my side uh, to everyone. Uh, Yes, we can hear you well and see your screen as well. OK, um, so um, I'm pleased to give you some insights on the question of which steps for a munici munici municipality to launch a solar heating project, um, adding the arguments of uh, Berdl app. Uh, and this is one on, uh, on one example, it's Friesach, it's in Carinthia, it's one province in Austria. You can see also the opening ceremony on the picture here and I give you some insights on the motivation, on the success factors and on the learnings from the community and from the mayor. Uh, and my name is Roger Hackstock from the uh, Association Austria Solar Solar Thermal Association. Uh, it's not the only uh, district heating system in Austria. We have a large potential in municipalities on district heating, on biomass district heating plants who could be combined with solar thermal. We have around 2,500 biomass district heating plants uh, and two thirds of it are operated also in summer. So they are a show a big potential on using solar thermal energy in the district heating system to use solar thermal energy instead of burning biomass. And you see they are uh, spread all over Austria. Uh, the example I will uh, show you, I will explain, I will go into it is the example of Friesach and it might be special, it's a medieval town. And in a medieval town, you might not think of solar thermal in the first place because you have all these issues of uh, uh, heritage uh, um, buildings and you have to, to cover that um, very carefully and so, but even in this medieval town, they installed this out of the town and it's not far out of the town, it's two kilometers out of the town. It's a large solar thermal field in Friesach, this is the name of the town and you can see it. this is the street going by, it heads directly to the center of uh, of the community of the city and uh, this is the map where you can see where the uh, solar field is covered down at the picture and in the middle you can see the biomass heating plant and uh, the heating grid with this uh, red lines and so you can see it's a um, town with 
4,900 inhabitants and approximately 500 households and also a hospital are uh, supplied by solar heat by this uh, net length of 10 kilometer, which is added with a solar thermal installation. Uh, there are in this uh, biomass heating plant, there are two biomass boilers with 4 megawatt and 1.5 megawatt. It was commissioned in 1995, the whole uh, district heating net and the solar modernization, so adding a large solar thermal installation happened in 2019, so it's quite recently, with what you saw before are 5,750 square meters of collector area and 1,000 cubic, cubic meter buffer storage, that means one million liter of hot water is located close to the biomass heating. Uh, plant. So it's um, at the biomass heating plant, not at the uh, solar inst installation site. So there is a one kilometer pipe between the buffer storage and the collector area. So this gives, gives you uh, a picture how everything is uh, located the, of the solar heat in the network. And the operation in summer and winter is quite easy to describe in summer. There is a combination of the uh, biomass that's only used in a minimum, uh, mainly by solar energy, by buffer, buffer storage, and then goes into the district heat heating grid of Friesach. Uh, and in winter, uh, the role of the biomass is more crucial. Uh, it's again, solar thermal is fed into the, uh, the solar thermal energy fed into the buffer storage and uh, also biomass peak load is fed into the buffer storage and all the load goes back to the heating grid and supplying in winter the heating grid together biomass and solar thermal of freezer. So that's the basic uh, function principle. Uh, what was the motivation by the community? Uh, this was uh, at the table, you can see this was a high level um, meeting of the mayor, you can see him from, you can see his back here, uh, together with the project developer, with uh, with the ministry, with the minister, the climate minister of climate in Austria. She's uh, the women, uh, the third, uh, the third women from the left. She's the minister, and also of uh, uh, very high level politicians over there. Beside her, of the minister. Uh, is uh, the highest political the governor of the province of uh, Carinthia. And at the end of the table, I'm also looking very curious on all this uh, scene. Uh, I joined it. So uh, the motivation by the community was they wanted to increase energy efficiency by an integrated, holistic and innovative energy concept. So that was the target, that was the aim. Uh, and uh, the expansion of uh, renewable energy should uh, deliver a contribution to the heat and energy transition that was the target of the community, this, this uh, transition. And uh, it was important that it should deliver a regional domestic added value also in the region, in the city of Friesach. Um, they used uh, strategic cooperation and partnerships with local companies that was quite uh, important uh, and uh, the aim was doing instead of just talking and learning from it and this, this also was what the mayor told me that this was the main aim of his engagement doing instead of just talking and learning from it so that, that's what he uh, repeated several times so this was the motivation by the community it could have also be reached without solar thermal but uh, they decided to include solar thermal in their concept. So what were the factors of success in, in, in the bottom of the picture? You see uh, in the bottom of, of the slide, you see a picture of the uh, of the whole installation. So the factors of success from the view of the mayor was uh, that there had been subsidies for solar thermal energy at federal and state level. Let's say half of the installation costs were subsidized by public authorities. 
One factor of success, it was also a crucial factor, was land availability, the location, the size, the dedication, the price. So this took uh, the most of the time of the whole five years planning period to find uh, the proper land because there were different landowners. Uh, they had to cope with one up the other uh, until they found uh, a landowner who uh, who, who agreed to have this uh, solar installation on his land. Uh, the type of energy source to be substituted was also a factor of success because uh, it's biomass energy that is uh, substi substituted and that's a bit similar to what Bell App uh, presented before that they wanted to save biomass in summer and not burn biomass in summer for solar thermal, for, for a district heating uh, demand. Uh, a crucial success was that they had a uh, need for a relevant summer load. So this is uh, a district heating network that is operated also in summer. And it has uh, suitable system temperatures. And it's a suitable network. That means it's a quite dense network with uh, not so high system temperatures, normal system temperatures, not really optimized temperatures, but normal temperatures in over an average district heating system in Austria. And uh, also what the mayor pointed out, what pointed to is that uh, the factor of success were strong partnerships and to keep at it stubbornly. So to keep at it at, at um, really, uh, really hard, and not to to let go if if problems happen. So uh, strong partnerships who help to realize the whole project and to stick at it. Yeah, to really be dedicated. He was really dedicated to as a mayor to this project, and this was one factor of success. Uh, what were the learnings? This is a picture of the mayor Josef Kronlechner. A warm greetings from him. Yeah. Uh, it's in it's the, the oldest town in Carinthia with a medieval town center, and even then they managed to make this uh, to realize these large solar thermal installations. And the learnings he will give he will pass also to you. He said uh, is that after contacting the project developers, quickly consult the responsible politicians for the zoning for finding the lands for uh, the land uh, area for the installation. So this is the first um, the first place uh, consult the politicians and obtain very quickly support from environmental NGOs because they could opposite they could work opposite uh, the uh, installation if they are not uh, included from the start. And if they agree uh, to the installation then this is also a strong argument for the politicians that they are in the boat the, the uh, um, en environmental NGO, uh, NGOs that are saving birds and the nature and everything. Um, it's very important that the mayor personally is dedicated and promotes the project to the responsible state offices. So if you want to, if you are thinking to launch a project, then you really have to be convinced and dedicated to the project. But this also raises uh, it tremendously uh, the possibility of success. So personally, he promoted is it over years, the mayor, uh, and also find a story that describes the project. For instance, in this case, the story to the politicians and to the NGOs was that these, this solar installation connects the historical heritage with modern energy supply. So we have a historical heritage here we have to take care of, but we are also part of the future and we want people to live here and be happy during also the next decades and the next centuries. And uh, this connection of past and future was, one, was part of the core part of the story they told uh, together with this solar thermal installation. Communicate the benefits of the project uh, locally at events in the local council. So it's important to also communicate the benefits within Friesach, not only outside Friesach to politicians, to NGOs, but also within to the population, to the stakeholders, to the opinion leaders in uh, the community. 
And uh, last but not least, very important, play with open cards. Uh, he told me that uh, it's important that you don't argue, you don't find arguments that uh, turn out to be false uh, somewhere in between the process or uh, that people think that yeah, it's, it's not an, an, an honest um, um, initiative. So play with open cards and tell everyone, this is the story, this is my engagement, and these are the advantages, and that's what we want. But then it can work out. Uh, and uh, it might look in the end like that. Uh, this is a picture of the installation. And what you can see here, what even looks like a castle. Yeah, That's not by chance. That, that's because it's a medieval town and everything there that looks like a castle. Many things, many, many installations, many uh, buildings. And also the, the containers with the technology there. Yeah with the, the heat uh, uh, exchanger there. Uh, these containers are uh, covered and surrounded by this medieval looking cover of wood cover, looks like a castle. And even you see the staircases, you can walk up there and you can have a, can have a look uh, from above to the installation. And uh, if you pass by on the street, it looks like another castle in this medieval town. And this was also one step to get acceptance by all stakeholders and uh, the population there. So uh, you see this is a project managed and organized by heart. And this is one of the success factors uh, that we can give you as an advice. So thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Roger for this very nice uh, presentation about a quite uh, uh, interesting example of uh, quite small towns, but still be able to, to do uh, impressive uh, work. I don't know, uh, I don't see any question in the chat. Uh, so if you have question, just raise your hand or ask your question in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, maybe I have already a question for you, Roger, about uh, more, not on the, this example, but on, um, and what happened in, in Austria during the last, uh, let's say, year and, and, and last winter also, um, what, the, what the energy crisis also changed in Austria, uh, especially for the solar heating system and uh, what has been the, the feedback from, well, your, your members, but also uh, uh, if, there, if there was a boom of, uh, let's say, new plants uh, in development, yeah, there were uh, not immediately new plans because, as you realized by my example and the example of Beverly App, that it took five years uh, until from from the initial idea to really starting the supply of the solar field. So uh, it it happens over time, but the, there was much more attention on uh, renewable district heating solutions, also uh, renewable heating solutions for the industry last year. Yeah, and it it lasted until now, much more attention. Uh, and uh, people submitted also feasibility studies to the subsidy program in Austria, where uh, around 1 million square meter feasibility studies are ongoing uh, because of this uh, uh, turmoil in the energy system, in the energy uh, of energy prices and energy supply. So uh, we, we realized a high attention on this issue. Uh, and we have uh, actually another installation similar to Friesach in Mürzuschlag, that's um, uh, 200 kilometers away in another province, in the province of Styria. And we actually will have uh, an excursion to both of these installations on the 23rd of January. So all listeners from Austria, uh, go to our website, Austria Solar, and uh, have a look. You can join the uh, excursion. Uh, there are still places left, places uh, vacant. Yeah, but this is this is what we realized: high attention, but it takes time. So better to to start uh, as early as possible, yeah. let's say. Better to start now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there is a question uh, in the chat about uh, the question of the subsidies. Um, the question is. Is the subsidies were directly provided by the national government to the cities and towns, or does it go to other kind of actors? Uh, it it went to the investor. 
So the investor sub, uh, sub, uh, submitted their proposal for, uh, for subsidy to the subsidy authority, to the national authority and also the authority of the province. And both uh, gave subsidies and we have this national subsidy program that gives up to 50% of subsidies. So they also use that. And additionally, they got subsidies. So this was around 40% uh, in, in, uh, in, in, rea in reality. And then additionally, they uh, used subsidies from the province. So around half of the investment was subsidized, but the subsidy didn't go to the city and town. It went to the, or it, yeah, it went to the investor. And the investor was not the city and town. The investor was a project developer. Uh, and yeah, and they, they invested it and also they, they run it. And it also was a, 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 partic a participation project where people uh, around, I think 300 people uh, buy shares of the uh, installation and it's a sale and lease back model. So you, you bought a share of uh, the 5,750 square meters and they, uh, um, uh, they they bought, uh, uh, took it back. They leased it back, yeah, uh, to operate this uh, the whole installation. So it was a public participation financing model also included. Yeah, yeah which is a very nice way to of include, uh, of course, the, the people and the inhabitants. And maybe uh, you there mentioned. There is another question: Which generation would? This uh, domestic heating corresponds to what? 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 I don't. I'm not sure if I understand it properly. What does it mean? Which generation? Would well, it there, to? there are kind of a classification of uh, the generation of district heating, uh, which is mostly based on uh, the temperature level in the district heating system and also well the number i mean how much decentralized uh, the supply is from one plant or, or several plants in fact um, but maybe to answer that question what what is the temperature level in this district heating system do you know um i, I don't know it uh, um I can't say it at the moment. I would have to look into the, the documents on the temperature levels. And it covers uh, the solar share is around, uh, I think, uh, like 500 households out of the 4,900 can be, as, um, uh, it's, it's calculated that they can be supplied around the year. That means 10%. So 10% solar share in the total uh, district heating energy demand during the year is covered by the solar thermal installation, 10%, around 10%. And there is another question to ask to our participant, okay? Yeah, a question from Barbara. Uh, I don't know if anyone would like to take the floor to answer the question of Barbara about uh, the, yeah, the planning, uh, step in which you are in your city if if you are at the moment uh, developing a, a solar heating plant or you can also write in the chat I don't see any end raised maybe a last question uh, Roger regarding one point you mentioned about the uh, opposition from uh, sometimes uh, environmental NGOs does it often happen uh, and if yes could you explain us a bit uh, yeah the kind of debate uh, you have with them or that yeah. or city uh, could often, have with them yeah yeah often uh, NGOs uh, they are opposite of uh, renewable energy installations in in uh, in the countryside yeah because of uh, the aesthetical um, issues because of uh, saving birds and saving uh, also nature, saving animals and so, and it's always a discussion, yeah. They are very careful in uh, looking for uh, environment uh, issues, environmental issues. So it's, uh, it's always an issue, independently if you um, try to install a wind park or a PV site or a solar thermal site, if it's a large site in the landscape, 
then it's always uh, an, an, an issue. And in this case, especially, uh, they had to move the, uh, the site uh, by a few hundred meters outside of what they had planned, outside of the, uh, more outside of the city, because uh, there was um, at the uh, at the plan each each community has a, um, a formal plan of uh, of the dedication of the of the um, of the land area yeah and it was uh, uh, wild animals uh, are crossing uh, the lands the landscape on certain paths and it was a wild animals crossing path that really exactly crossed the uh, solar thermal installation during uh, uh, in, in the middle of the solar thermal installation there would have been uh, a wild animal crossing path and there was no simple solution to that and so they quit this uh, land area and moved a few hundred meters uh, far outside of the uh, center of the city so that to get rid of this problem because there was no such path there marked in the plans of the community for okay. instance yeah. very uh, yeah very interesting uh to well by, these are uh, the details you have to cope with yeah yeah to to be able to have a consultation it, it with be, all the you know, stakeholders you, you try to uh, you try to fix uh, land, land area and then NGOs are coming and saying uh, that they are a uh, very certain frog is living or other animals uh, and the frog savers say no it's not possible to make uh, a solar installation there because the animal this rare animal will be disturbed uh, and will not proliferate, pro proliferate uh, any longer and so and uh, you have you have to cope with them but it's easier to talk with them at the start because on the other hand, they also want to have a, a climate uh, a crisis saving uh, installations. And like that, they know that uh, the climate crisis is real and is there. And uh, also their frogs are uh, also threatened by the climate crisis. So they, are, they have two hearts in their uh, mind and their body. And you have to address the right, the right one of these hearts in, at the start. Of course, but biodiversity is an important uh, aspect also to take into always, consideration. It's always, uh, and it's also uh, that uh, also important that if you uh, plan an installation like that, that you have a biodiversity concept with it. And they also yeah. have it here. So what I didn't show is that uh, they have a sheep herd uh, between the collector uh, rows and they are there. There is no harvesting machine or so for keeping the grass down but they have this ship uh, this 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 sheep herd there yeah hey, okay very interesting thanks a lot for sharing uh, all your uh, experience from austria um, and now we are going to move to latvia uh, with another impressive uh, example of the carbonization of district heating and cooling so i will give the floor to ina berzina veta who is the managing director of the energy company of salas pills and also as mentioned president of the latvian association of oh. heating companies and the advisor of the minister of climate and energy of the republic of latvia thanks a lot for being with us the floor is yours okay uh, do you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, good. Oh my God. Okay. So, my name is Ina and I'm from Salaspils. Salaspils is the quite small city not far away from Riga, the capital of Latvia. And when I... Uh, came to the municipal owned district heating company it was typically a soviet time district heating company with the 100 percent dependence on natural gas and uh, very old infrastructure and as i learned from my earlier experience it's uh, the slogan which I lived with is don't put all your eggs in one basket and especially we saw that this was the right slogan for this year. So step by step 
we started to change our uh, structure of our um, fuels. And first steps was to build the wood chip boiler. Then we also added the flue gas condenser. And the next was the decision to uh, put the solar to heat. Uh, and the main uh, idea why we did that, because on the basic load of the, our district heating annual consumption was the cogeneration on uh, the natural gas, based on natural gas, and uh, around year 2019, the support of this technology and gas will be ended and they understood that this is the right place how we can put in the basic load during the summer is the solar so and we started to uh to make uh, all possible investigations about those technologies and uh, as you know latvia is quite north and there were a lot of different uh, doubts about do, you, do Latvia has a solar power enough in order to produce that. But then we thought, okay, then uh, Denmark as the number one country in the solar, we checked that they have approximately the same radiation of solar as in Latvia. But in the meantime, we also put the PV panels on our roof uh, of our uh, production site and we saw that the it is a radiation of uh, it is a solar radiation enough and if we compare with Denmark it's the same and a little bit more so it even give us um, uh, give us more strength to, to go ahead we also attracted to the project the EU financing, which is a, a cohesion funds for decarbonization. Uh, then we started to work uh, together with municipality. We got a lot of su support of municipality in order to uh, help us with the enlarging the, our territory of land. We were very lucky, lucky because near us there were the territory which was not used for agriculture or any other. It was quite destroyed, uh, destroyed land near us. Now it looks even more beautiful than before. And as also our previous uh, previous um, uh, speakers talked for us it's also took about five years until we commissioned the plant before that it's uh, it's the way how to do and what to do first of all uh, there are many um, times were mentioned about the temperatures and uh, in, from the first day when i came that in year 2011 we started to renovate all heat networks so we changed all um, all the plants. We also put a remote uh, data reading system so we can monitor the consumption temperatures in each house and also uh, build a cooperation with the heat users in order to um, put the consumption properly and the most effective with regulation on sites. And as the end, uh, we first of all we had we made the losses from 22 percent to less than 10 percent we managed to lower the temperature uh, supply and return temperature in uh, winter time is 90 to 60 degree and in summertime is 60 and 40 degree back and it uh, it is not, I, I can, uh, can say you that there is not a modern house which has, let's say, floor heating or, or it's an old Soviet time houses which are, are going to renovation. Now we are also helping to the uh, houses to um, prepare documents and help them to renovate houses. As municipal company, we feel very responsible for that 
that consumption is properly on the other side too. So as a result, as a result, we installed our uh, our uh, solar uh, solar to heat, which is about 20, uh, 22,000 square meters. And um, it's an active field and about 60,000 uh, square meters is the land field. One of the major things there is the storage. The storage, as I said, is like our uh, one more production production unit. This is, uh, we couldn't make the, uh, the ground or seasonal storage because uh, our geology didn't allow us. There is not nearly not possible to dig into, into the land in, in, in our territory. So we had an on, um, we had the uh, storage of 8,000 cubic meters, with, which allows us to store the heat for, from three to five days if it's no sun. And our main idea is uh, for development is not only uh, it's not only to to be a renewable but, uh, with the cheap boils but um, boiler, but our goal is to go uh, on no fuels at all, so decarbonization. And now we are doing a research on uh, heat pump installation, and we have also the measurements done nearly one years about the wind possibilities. But as Marble mentioned at the beginning, now we see after the, since the last year crisis and war, there is a big development also in Latvia in electricity production on renewables and also wind. And it looks that the price of, of the electricity will be so low that we can use the low price electricity during the wind is blowing. And I also want to mention, after one year of working uh, on and producing heat from solar, we saw how much electricity we needed and we installed exactly the uh, needed installation of PV, uh, of PV uh, solar, uh, solar production, which actually supply us with solar all needed uh, all needed electricity for the heat production from solar and we are not using grids and not sending the electricity uh, to the to the grids which gives us cheaper the production let's say so that's in, in general all if you want to ask any question you are most welcome Thank you very much, Anna, from uh, for your presentation. Uh, is there any question from our participants for Anna? Yes, I, Roger. I might uh, add that in Frieza it's the same. There is uh, part of the installation on the edges of the installation is PV of the solar thermal field, the part is uh, small, part is PV, covering the uh, electricity demand for the pumps, in the district for the, for the network pumps, uh, when the solar thermal installation is in operation, when the sun shines, so also there is the electricity there, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's about uh, uh, autarky, it's about the same amount of electricity that is produced on site that the solar thermal field needs to pump the heat to the biomass district uh, heating boiler. Yeah? So it's it's the same there. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So it's really interesting to go further for the decarbonization of the full system. Uh, Babel, you have a question? Yes, Maybe. I have a question to Ina as well uh, regarding your transformation from a Soviet, um, you know, district heating grid to one which uh, can in accept solar heat, referring to what we were asked before on temperature levels. How, what was at the beginning the temperature levels and how did you manage to reduce the temperature levels so that stationary collectors were able to feed into it? 
actually the temperatures the temperatures was quite close it's around 100 100 degrees but uh, the most important i'm not technical you know but <laughs> but as far as i know we managed to to control the backward temperature which is return temperature by monitoring how the consumer is using so how how they use the the uh, the heat which is on the houses so we see uh, uh, we see how what temperature goes in and when it, it goes out and that means we should regulate inside all <laughs> different things in order to get to uh, that the house take the temperature and not sending just here and back with the same degree so we check those delta t in 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 houses so that's that is uh, actually it's very very important so you can see how your Thank you for this answer. Any other uh, question from our participant for Ina? There's one in the chat. I can read it. What is the main motivation to reduce the use of biomass using prices of biomass? reduced availability or is it just that you foresee a much lower heat price for heat pumps? Ina. Yes, actually the, there are two motivations. First of all, if we are not, if you can't burn, if you are not pollute, you should do it as much as possible. And, and in summer, that's for sure. And uh, that's one thing. The other is I see the future in the integration of different energy sectors. And as uh, we are going to install more and more solar PVs and wind energy, it will be spare electricity in the market. And district heating is really like a accumulator of, of, of this cheap electricity as Denmark does. I'm sure it's the same also will come in, in Latvia too. And the third part is uh, we should use as much uh, um, waste heat as possible and as I know that there uh, there is a plan of data center is not is building their uh, um, project not far off from us and then I'm sure if they will do we, we will have 100% uh, renewables and and about 50% no fuels at all decarbonization which means and, and that's I think everybody should look into that what we can do not to burn anything. And it helps to stabilize price, that's for sure. We have one of the best prices this this year and, and this is clean and green and you feel good. <laughs> uh, there is another question in the chat, which I'm not sure I really understand uh, exactly what is the question. So maybe uh, Levin Van Horek back well, if you would like to. Yeah, I will go into this first and then Roger, maybe you can add. It's a question of PVT panels. Uh, PVT panels are panels which look like a PV element on the top and have a solar collector on the bottom, which is interlinked to the PV um, element and can a bit cool the PV, but what is very intelligent, you can produce PV as you have a normal PV generator, but you have a heat source as well, which is at a lower, a bit lower temperatures than normal collectors. But um, well, it's a rather new technology. It's used a lot in residential, mainly in Holland and um, in France. But um, we see the first plans, and Roger, you have to step into this now, that um, where you know, where large PVT plants, for example, for the industry, where there is a need for electricity and for heat, uh, together with heat pumps, could provide both to an industry. And maybe we will see this also for district heating. I'm not aware yet of a PVT plant for district heating directly, but as it is now, well, the first time done in larger scales in feasibility studies in Austria, I think that um, this could be a really an option. Roger, you want to um, add to that? Yeah, that's true that PVT uh, mainly is targeted to industry applications at the moment. 
recently, not to district heating, uh, because also with district heating you need uh, rather high temperatures and you have to use your land area to produce high temperatures because land area is expensive. So to use PVT means uh, that you reduce uh, the yield of uh, high temperatures in, in, in your field. So this is also an economical, um, uh, not so uh, I mean questionable if this is if it if, if it makes sense to use. So up to now nobody had the idea to use PVT for for uh, district heating, but I. I have a question to Ina that you uh, mentioned 8,000 uh, cubic meters of storage. These are steel tanks. Steel tank, yeah, yeah it's, it's online steel, steel tank. And these are several steel tanks because in Frisa no, we have 1,000 square, 1,000 uh, cubic meter and that's rather uh, a large uh, tank already. So if I think eight times this tank, this is a really huge tank. Isn't, is, is this the case? Um, it's, it's, a, it, it's quite a big tank, yeah. but as I said, it's, uh, it supports us on, five, on three to five days when it's no sun. And uh, this is really very good. So you, first of all, you can collect also during the winter time where there's no sun, you can collect also boiler. You can work with boiler more efficient and uh, collect also from uh, condenser more heat and then when it's colder you can use also it instead of gas. I mean we managed to use this accumulator tank during all the year and it gives us a lot of efficiency and also sure enlarge the solar uh, solar share during the year we managed to do it up to 20 percent during the year. The storage uh, is very important and and do, do put it as large as possible and need it because it's 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 real a, a golden part of the system i think it's it might be one of the largest steel tanks in solar district heating systems in europe Yep. Now we have one, one big in, in, co, in cogeneration plant, uh, gas cogeneration plant, about uh, 10,000 square cubic meters, also steel tank. Okay, very interesting. Thanks a lot to stress the importance of, of the storage in uh, increasing the efficiency and decarbonization. Uh, we have some uh, discussion in the chat also, and. Uh, an answer to the question of uh, bubble regarding uh, the, the planning status of uh, some plants maybe uh, across Europe uh, and we have an answer from Strasbourg. Um, Mr. De La Roche Lambert, do you want to uh, take the floor to explain a bit the situation in, in Strasbourg shortly? Uh, okay, with pleasure. Uh, we're working uh, right now uh, on, uh, on a project of uh, uh, an expanding uh, use of the actual uh, district heating of the Euro Metropolis Strasbourg, which is a, a big, uh, <laughs> big city, and uh, we we want to to use more district heating for for renewable transition. We want to to use maximum of uh, renewable energy. Uh, available on the on the territories, and so um, we are planning to to to, to use also uh, some of solar uh, heating because um, I studied it uh, for a long time and I discussed with uh, the, the municipality and our staff, uh, our team uh, here in uh, the the Femto Institute and the um, National Conservatory of Research. In Strasbourg, we have a team which is working on uh, on the, the energy planning, and uh, we are discussing here with the uh, with the municipality to 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 add uh, a future installation of a thermal uh, solar plant. Uh, we are looking for a place for this, and uh, we are calculating the the, the share of uh, of uh, energy uh, use uh, for uh, over a year and uh, 
also the the the, in, the economic uh, interest interest of uh, of using it um, right now because we have also uh, the possibility to to use um, uh, heat waste uh, coming from industry and so how to manage the the evolution of uh, the district heating of this uh, big city uh, to uh, inject more and more uh, low temperature renewables and low temperature uh, waste heat and so on and so on. so uh, it's a i don't it's a long term project but uh, we're working on it right now we we, we plan to be 100% re renewable uh, as short as possible perhaps uh, uh, 2000 uh, before 2050 we want to be uh, faster on, on our transition because it's urgent it's an emergency <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's a, a very big project and we are we have uh, many many re uh, research to, to do this and uh, uh, it's um, many we are working on simulation also for the future and uh, this is a uh, a, a big challenge for us. Cool. Oh, Good. We we can we can uh, keep in touch because uh, I think it's very interesting to to use the the, the experience of the other countries. So I know very well Denmark. So uh, I'm working with my colleagues <laughs> in the energy planning department of the University of Aalborg. And Aalborg, so, okay. Uh, we, we, I think we have a lot to, to learn <laughs> by Lithuania and uh, yeah, and also Austria and Germany also. So it's good Thanks. to work together. <laughs> very good. Yes. Thanks for the insight and very interesting because uh, friends need to uh, catch up uh, regarding solar heating because it's not a technology very well uh, developed in France. While on the other side. Uh, district heating uh, system are expanding. There are quite a number of them already quite decarbonized with mostly using uh, biomass and uh, also um, waste incineration. Um, but it's a pity yeah, because there is a huge uh, untapped potential in France for, for solar heating. Ina, you have a, you had a question maybe? Uh, you have your raised hand. Yeah, I, I, if I may add, I was just just to say do it and go ahead and don't hesitate also to use the heat pumps in, uh, during the summertime air to water because it's very efficient work now uh, according to our calculations. We are, I hope next year we will install it too because it's, yeah, go ahead. Go yes, yes, ahead. yes. And we, we want to plan also the cooling uh, district here because it has to be connected to so the whole system. <laughs> Uh, the problem in France is that we have a very few in, uh, district heating uh, cover it. It's very uh, only uh, seven percent is a very a few installation compared to Denmark or to uh, Lithuania or, uh, Lithuania or to, to Sweden. <laughs> well, very late in France. But I have to protest here uh, just a bit uh, regarding France because I saw New Heat uh, representative on our call today. New Heat um, did some really nice uh, projects on solar district heating in France. Mm -hmm. And I will share with you uh, in the chat uh, a link to where we have described some uh, most well results from uh, some innovative plants which were yeah. installed, one in Geneva and one in France. And you see that the yields are very nice and um, so... Right. I know it. Julia, you have really yes. a nice <laughs> bit yeah, of uh, solar district heating already. <laughs> yeah, there are some nice examples, but unfortunately, yeah, still uh, not uh, but it's, it's widely the beginning widespread. of a curve exactly. up, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we have a, a raised hand from Nicola Gravelin. Uh, we have a still yes. a, this is a bit, a bit of time, a bit of time. So shortly, if you if you want to share with us, very quickly. Hello, Nicolas Gravelin from New Heat. Uh, missed. Uh, we are uh, always working with universities, and we can share, and we are sharing already uh, the data of uh, the two plants in Pont and Narbonne. And so, uh, uh, Mr. Professor, if you if you want. 
uh, we have been doing that in the past and we can share uh, the, the data sets that we have over two years of operation, which often are really helpful in terms of future simulation of, uh, of uh, patterns. Yes, thank so, you very much. It would be very nice. I, I know Please you're... get in contact um, with me and I'll, I'll, I'll link you with our modelization department, which could provide a, okay. a hour by, by hour data set for the last uh, two years. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good. Thank you. Thanks for sharing and uh, yeah, good to continue the discussion after our web webinars. Uh, we are coming uh, almost to an end. Uh, just maybe give the floor uh, to Catalin. We had a quite dis some discussion in the chat, but maybe uh, Catalin, if you would like to uh, share with us, um, well, some example of uh, transformation uh, regarding storage. If you want to unmute yourself, yeah. Yes, thank you very much for giving me the chance to exchange some information with you. Uh, <clears throat> actually, we are working uh, on. Can you introduce on... yourself? Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm, my name is Katarin Dragostin. I'm a managing director of Energy Surf. Uh, this is an uh, ESCO type company, energy efficiency company. And uh, we are heavily involved in uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency and renewable energy. Our experience is uh, back, background is uh, normally power utility business. We used to work for many years in uh, uh, power industry in Romania. And uh, especially in the combined heat and power applications. Uh, but lately, of course, uh, as a private company, we, <coughs> we are heavily involved in um, as well in industry, but also in industry heating systems, uh, decarbonizing them. And um, we are working now actually on two projects. And one of them is uh, um, switching from coal and gas completely by 2028, a city in Romania completely from gas and coal to renewable. And uh, we made a planning, long, long, medium and long term planning to find out uh, which is the long run marginal cost of the heat uh, for the city. Actually, they consume, uh, they have an installed capacity of heat of about 120, 130 megawatt uh, heat capacity as of today. And based on their load profile, we try to identify um, which is the best uh, mix of technologies to be applied. And uh, we did find out that on an average uh, period of time, uh, uh, heat storage uh, is very important for the system because uh, they have huge uh, capacities of uh, fuel oil tanks and we want to convert them, uh, in in, uh, to convert them into heat storage. And um, we did analyze, and this is very cost effective. I mean, it's a huge capacity. It is a very cost uh, effective to have because we have them already. And most of the tanks are already half of them buried in, in, under, in, the, in the land, under the soil. And with proper insulation, we can have a very good uh, uh, storage capacity which we plan to put in it uh, everything available <laughs> for waste heat. Uh, um, uh, sometimes the heat from the cogeneration plants, which we designed and uh, in order to keep uh, electricity uh, to play on the uh, day ahead market, uh, excess heat will be stored. I mean, it's a complex analysis which we did because we want to combine heat and power and storage capacities into the heat storage, of course, and to supply to cover the heat demand and to play on the day ahead market, electricity market. It's a little bit um, sophisticated analysis, which we, we did, and it is possible because the electricity generation from uh, combined heat and power on biomass and waste would improve dramatically the will decrease dramatically the cost of heat supplied and uh, we designed the heat pumps to be powered by the biomass uh, chp because we need green heat 
So the heat pump capacity would be directly linked to the to the CHP and the waste. So basically, these are the philosophy which we are following up. The target is uh, completely green energy, heat green energy by 2028, lately, latest. So if you have any questions, I'd okay. be delighted to answer anything, no problem. Thank you very much for sharing. And uh, don't hesitate to leave also your, your contact uh, in the chat. Also, I think people will be quite happy to get in touch with you uh, afterwards. Yes, I will. Uh, I will type it straight away, right away. Thank you. Um, if there are no any more questions, I think we'll come to the end uh, of this webinar. Uh, there was a question about if the presentation uh, will be shared. And yes, the presentation will be shared uh, with all participants as well as uh, the recording. Um, and then I'm just going to uh, share my screen with you. Yeah, so I would like uh, to conclude uh, first to thanks our speaker. Thanks a lot for uh, joining us today. It was really interesting to hear from your uh, example, and it's a clear demonstration about uh, the potential of solar heat to decarbonize district heating and cooling. Uh, of course, uh, solar heat can help to decarbonize, but also it has many other benefits, like increasing the energy security of the cities, uh, keeping heat affordable uh, with stable price uh, over 20 years at least, and um, not the least, uh, developing solar heating project also uh, is a way to create uh, local jobs, which is also very important. So solar heating is a proven technology uh, to, to really achieve a city's goal regarding decarbonization and to help you to move forward also uh, in your planning. Uh, we have planned a second uh, webinars during which we will go more into details. So it's on the 5th of June. Uh, you have the link to register in uh, the conversation. Uh, we'll speak about um, planning and also tendering process. Uh, first, with one presentation of uh, Magdalena Berberich, uh, who is Deputy De Director of uh, Solitas, but also involved in the International Energy Agency uh, Task 68. Uh, then we'll go into the technical aspect to consider, and especially regarding temperature question uh, that was uh, already mentioned today uh, with uh, someone from Plan Energy. And then uh, we'll finish with uh, more question regarding the economic uh, case for the solar plant uh, so that you have all information uh, or I mean more information to move forward in your own planning uh, with uh, someone from TNO. So that's the plan uh, for our next um, webinars uh, in the 5th of June. And um, I also uh, would like to mention that we have um, feedback survey uh, for this webinar that I also put in the chat and that uh, uh, we kindly ask you to uh, fill. With that, uh, I would like to uh, thank you again uh, for joining today. Thanks again to our uh, speakers and don't hesitate to contact us if you have uh, any question later. So thank you very much and have a very good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you as well. Great day for everybody. Thank you. See thank you, you on the 5th of June thank again. You. Thank <laughs> you. Bye. Bye. Bye.